today. Thank you for joining us. This is the Plymouth Historical Society's latest initiative, The Memories of Plymouth. It's a collection of stories, thoughts, um, so we can better understand what a community is, what a special place Plymouth is. Today we're very pleased to have Milton Peck Peckengill join us. So th thank you for joining me, Milton. Okay, you're welcome. All right, for the next hour I've known, or so. I've known her since she was <laughs> so high. Shh. Don't tell anybody <laughs> that. Don't tell anybody <laughs> that. <laughs> we, we have a series of questions today that we'd like to ask you. And, and part of it is to take people back to a specific time and um, get to know you a little bit better, too. We know there's a lot of people in town that know who you are. And we know that there's some people that have heard of you. And there may be one or two people out there that have never heard of you. Oh, go ahead. And for that reason, we'd like to have some questions being asked right now about you. For example, what is your formal name? Milton E. Milton Elliot Pettengill. Is the name after anyone in your family? I don't know anybody by the name of Elliot. Okay. Milton, I'm named after a blind poet in England. My mother said that's what I was named after. Oh my, oh my. All right. Would you mind sharing with the audience? Your age, when you were born? I was born in Campton, New Hampshire, in a little white house stretches you across the brook going through from the lower village to the upper village. You go on her turns and there's a little white house that's underneath the hill. And back then, a lot of people were born at home. I was born at home, and of course they had a midwife, or whatever you call them, right. uh, from Thornton, and she did a lot of that living babies. She lived with me and she lived with my brother Ramsey. Uh, Eddie and Irene, I can't tell you. Mm -hmm. they're, they're older. They're but, uh, older than you? Yeah. So there were four children in your family? Four. four. We had almost two families. My brother and uh, my sister was the oldest and it's 12 years older than I am and my brother was 10 years older. Wow. And then all of a sudden I came along and then two years later, my younger brother came along. Really? So we had two families. Wow. Wow. Um, and again, the date that you were born? In New Hampshire. Date. Oh, oh date? Mm -hmm. January 15, 1927, just before Lindbergh, just before Lindbergh took off. Ah. Special <laughs> date. Special date. So, so you were born in Campton. Did yeah. you attend the Plymouth schools? I attended Plymouth schools from the sixth grade on. And what happened first grade through fifth? Uh, I was Campton. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And then what's the change? Did your family move here? They moved to, moved uh, to Plymouth. They moved closer to Plymouth. All right. Uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions about your education. Think how far back we can go. When you were in junior high school, when you were in high school, well, let's go back to elementary school, did you have any special teachers? Somebody well, that you enjoyed a lot? I think that... Uh, as far as high school went, and, and then around that period of time, every boy liked George Dawson. George Dawson, the coach? Coach. coach. He, he taught business, mm -hmm. and he was the coach. Mm. And he, he was good with the, boy, the boys. Now, girls I can't speak so much for, but mm -hmm. I'm sure he was good, fair and all that. Mm -hmm. But he, the boys all liked him. And when you were in high school, did you have extracurricular? I think I'm leading into this. Did you play sports? Were you I, in an art club? I didn't because I was, uh, we, the family was not very well to do, and I had to work after, our, after school hours. Hmm. I did get, uh, join the ski team mm -hmm. because I liked to ski, and I didn't mount too much, but I joined the ski team. Mm -hmm. 
and I played a little baseball, but I never played football or mm -hmm. any of those. And we didn't have volleyball back then. It's, uh, much more. Yeah. Uh, uh, skiing, was it a traveling team? Did you actually compete against other teams? Oh, yes. 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 Uh, the ski team didn't have many meets because there weren't many schools around that had ski teams. Hmm. You had uh, Plymouth, and you had Littleton, not, not Ashland, uh, Laconia, um, either Franklin or Tilton, or maybe combined the two there, and London. Hmm. I think it's about the only ones we. They, they were in the ski area. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they didn't have any ski team in Manchester and Concord because there's no skiing down around there. That's they right. Have. That makes sense. That makes sense. Hmm. Yeah. Let's see what we have. It, was there a, uh, we asked you about a special teacher that you had, Coach Dawson. Were there friends that you had at that time that you can remember their names too that maybe you've still kept in contact? Uh, my class, which graduated in 1944, uh, had the 70th class reunion. And we've had been having them every five years for a while. That's great. And I think we've had the last one because we've lost a couple of, of key people. Mm. We had a lady named Eunice Wenzel who kind of kept track of everybody and, and get these things organized. And the last one we had was just a luncheon up at the covered bridge. But the two or three of them went well that day. One of them went home and died two days later. And, but when you get up here, you just mm -hmm. day, day at a time, day at a time. Mm -hmm. Although I feel fine, I have no problems. Know. Oh, I have a few aches and pains once in a while. And I, my motion is out of stiffness in the joints. But, but, but other than that, I play golf. Mm -hmm. And until I moved up here, I played golf every day you in were Florida. In, in Florida. Yeah, mm -hmm. we lived on, in the golf community. Up here, uh, I'll have, I have to, I'm going to start playing golf, but I have to begin to meet the people, because up here, people who play golf are people I don't know right now. Oh. Mm -hmm. But that mm -hmm. doesn't bother you, it just uh, you have to kind of no, get to know them. Mm -hmm. and then you have conversation, you kid, and talk, tell stories. and. and Brag and <laughs> complain, <laughs> all those things. Yeah. Uh, uh, w we've talked about your family, four siblings. Uh, could we talk about your current family? Yeah. Yeah. Pat? My current family. Okay. Um, my wife came from Laconia, and we were married in 1950, and we had two children, mm -hmm. a boy and a girl. You, you know both of them, mm -hmm, I Peter do. and Nancy. Mm -hmm. And then Nancy had four. Children. children and then those four children they each had two four six they have seven children and Peter had two two girls and one is married one isn't and the one that's married has a daughter mm -hmm. so we have quite a few you do do is it fun being a grandparent and one is a great great no one is a great granddaughter wow wow <laughs> I'm not going to ask you if that feels... <laughs> no, 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 I'm not going there. I'm not going there. <laughs> uh, when we were chatting before, you had talked about um, being in the service. World, this is World War II. We really need to name the, the war. Um, would you give uh, a few pieces of information to the audience? What happened to you when you were recruited, when you joined the service? What branch of the service? Uh, we, I joined the Marine Corps in January of 1944, mm. and they said I could stay till I graduated from high school. So I actually went in the service in June of 44. 44. 18 years old? 45, 45, I'm sorry, 45. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went in the service with a young man from Lincoln, who, mm. high school, he, he and I both went in the Marine Corps. And this is, this is very funny. Neither one of us had ever had a train train ride, and we took the train from Boston, uh, took from Plymouth to Boston, and they put us up in a hotel just off Scully Square, we called the Argon Hotel, it's run by the Salvation Army, mm. and uh, but that was all right, and so we had once we got in there, 
They said, you can go roam around the area, but you have to be ready to go in the morning because we want to take you to the South Station and ship you to Paris Island. So we got up and I, I think we left Bot South Station somewhere around 8 o'clock in the morning, but I can't tell you, I don't remember exactly. I do know this, it was a troop train and it was, I, I don't know how many cars, it had more than just Marines on there, it, it, probably Army, Navy, or whatever. And it was full, more than full. Mm -hmm. And Freddie Dover, Locke, and I stood up from Boston to Washington, D.C. Wow. Because there were no seats. Wow. And you can do it, but it's kind of it's tiring. Mm -hmm. And when you sat on the seats, boy, that was a godsend. But anyway, and, we just, and then we left Washington for Paris Island on another train, but because that's a small area. And we got to Paris Island, and the way they greet young recruits at Paris Island is try to scare the hell out of them so that they don't, if you, they say anything, you, they'll do it immediately. You do it immediately. And so, and they tell you that you're mamby pambies and uh, you show sure so you're old enough to be in the Marines and all that kind of stuff. Zip, off goes your hair. <laughs> and they issue a pair of coveralls, a jacket and pants and shoes and socks and underwear. And you wear that for 12 weeks. And they, they kept you going, doing something day and night. They issue you a rifle. This is Marine Corps. They issue you a rifle and they say, this is your friend. You eat with it, you sleep with it, uh, you never leave it anywhere, you have it with you all the time. And, uh, uh, and we did. And it, it, it's just uh, one of those things you do, and you, you get accustomed to it very shortly. I don't mean I sleep with it, I, I put it down beside the bed, I didn't have to get it in mm -hmm. the bed. But anyway, and the Marine Corps, uh, the drill instructors, uh, I can't speak for the Army and Navy, but they will keep after you, so you don't even think, you just do it. He says something, you do it, automatically. They want, that's, what, that's the way they, they manage, do the things they can do. Nobody stops to question, they just do it. Hmm. And uh, it costs a lot of lives sometimes, I guess, but uh, and it, you do this for 12 weeks, you can't have any ice cream for 12 weeks. Mm. Paris Island in July and August is about, I think it's about 900 degrees, but it's up, up around 100. <laughs> and you, you're all continually moving, whether you're running or marching or something, but they keep moving. Mm -hmm. And when you get to bed, you just flop down. So as hot as it is, you, you go right to sleep. Mm. Uh, but at, at uh, about 10, 11 weeks, uh, 75 of us in the platoon, and during that time, we lost two. Mm -hmm. uh, one was a, uh, I don't know, some kind of an Indian from the Southwest. I don't know if it was Navajo or what he was, but a little short guy. He, he shouldn't have been there in the first place. He, he just couldn't keep up. Mm -hmm. And uh, another one lost, less, but I can't tell why. But we began to get pride. We're mm -hmm. we're, we're Marines. Pride. Oh boy, that's, that's, that's one thing mm -hmm. that uh, they have. The Marines will bellyache and squawk and take on among themselves. Mm -hmm. But don't ever get sad of the Marine and, and a bunch of other people there, because he's going to get mad and he's going <laughs> to snap it. And ain't anybody running him down, you know what I mean? But your stint that's in the pride. service was relatively short. Yeah. Yeah. Could you talk about that? You finished high school, you went into the service, and then how long were you in the service for? Uh, uh, 50, 18 months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that just makes me qualified as a World War II veteran, because the war, I got in there while the war in Japan was still going. I have never drawn any benefits. That I never had, had any occasion to, mm -hmm. but I am entitled to certain benefits and, even, and just say, just because I went through boot training. That's enough. But, uh, mm. uh, and I don't anticipate anything. I, I, 
I, uh, <laughs> if you could reflect on um, your time as a child in the area of Plymouth, surrounding town, if you yeah. want to, what might it be? What fun things did you do? Oh, we we we, were there, uh, we, we lived on Langdon Street. All right. And where the telephone office is down further on the corner of High Street mm -hmm. was a little tiny field. And we played sandlot baseball day in and day out during the summer. Hmm. And then we would get on the wooden skis, old wooden skis, and hike across the fields of Frontenac in the wintertime to go skiing up oh, there. Neat. I didn't get into basketball and baseball, but well, I've been baseball with sandlot. And we had probably 15 kids. Mm -hmm. that in, the, in the general neighborhood that mm -hmm. played baseball and I, I, I have to stop and think how we did, how we did it but uh, you we had some kind of a way of, of picking out who was going to bat first and then after that uh, you'd, you'd bat and you, we had only had three bases because we didn't have enough people and uh, if you hit a ball out there and one of the boys caught it then he comes in and he's batting and you're out in the field. So you made up your own rules. Yeah. And that's okay. Oh yeah. Oh, they, it worked. Hey, it worked. Boy, it worked. It worked fine. Oh it's, yeah. Oh, that's it, great. Yes. That's a great one. And uh, <laughs> there were really no winners. It, it, I guess the winner was the guy who stayed up there longest batting, you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. you have to get around three bases. Um, that's fun, thank you. Let, let's talk about the weather. I, I, I ask a question each time. Can you remember over the decades, was there anything related to weather perhaps, maybe not, that uh, affected you in some way? For some people they remember floods, they remember the ice jams. For other people it could be a hurricane, a tornado. Uh, anything there that you can recollect? Well, there's two things. Once, I can't remember, well we were playing over the D&M Park, a bunch mm -hmm. of us kids. Sure. And we looked down to the south, and we could see smoke rolling up. And next thing you know, the fire department was out there. They picked out the biggest boys, said, we want you to get a forest fire down Lower Interval. And so we went down to Lower Interval and up on what they call Rabbit Alley. Uh, I, I don't know what the real name is. But anyway, up there probably a half mile, then up on, up on the top of the hill and over the other side, and we were up there to, to fight that fire. And the fire got, got out of control to some degree wow. because uh, a man named Tuttle, you probably you don't know him, he used to be a mailman, mm. and he, they, they grabbed him to go down to, to supervise these eight or ten boys, whatever it was. And somebody got the word to him to get out of there. So he rounded us up and got us out of there because we were in a bad spot. We were down in the valley between two two little rises, mm. and, but we get out. That Can I ask you um, maybe what decade this was? You were how old, 14, 15? Oh no, I don't think, well, well maybe, maybe, maybe 12 to 15. 12 yeah. to 15. I, I guess it was more based on size than it was uh, the age, because mm -hmm. some guy that was 15 years old and was a little, little guy, they didn't want him, but they wanted boys they could do something if they and he thought he would supervise us and tell mm. us what to do we just went up there on our own you know wow. and, so yeah. this is probably the late 30s yeah late 30s early 40s perhaps yeah. wow thank you okay Ooh. the second thing was the hurricane of 38 and uh, uh, I was just I was seventh or eighth grade mm. and the school was the high school building where we were uh, the high school building where we were, the, the high school building was there but they the, just built the one where uh, the where Spear school was mm -hmm. elementary school yes, sure. elementary school sure and uh, we were, the kids were out playing around and so I said wait what are these kids doing out in the hurricane and uh, uh, they should be in school so next thing they knew they rounded us all up and put us in school they said they be better be in school sure. than roaming around outside in the hurricane, mm -hmm. which, it, which made sense. Mm -hmm. I said, what'd you do in the 38 hurricane? I said, I went to school. In school. So this occurred during the day, yeah. during the day when the children would have been in school. Yeah. 
Interesting, interesting. That's and and I, 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 a lot of them didn't get to school, of course, because probably didn't want to be out playing around. Hmm. But uh, the kids in that neighborhood, we lived on Langley Street, and the Ash kids lived next to the school, and mm -hmm. Tuttle's on Langley Street, and I can't remember now who hmm. everyone was, but they rounded us all up. But it was a large brick yeah. building, yeah. much more and secure. I, I don't remember whether they, uh, I don't remember the girls wouldn't be out playing in that, that weather, and whether they took them out of the homes and put them in school, I don't remember. Hmm. Hmm. But I, 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 I have to I'll keep telling what did you do in the hurricane? I said, went to school. <laughs> went to school. Went to school. <laughs> um, yeah. If I was to ask you about major changes that have occurred over your lifetime, major changes in the town of Plymouth, why, what might some of them be? Major changes in major the town. Major changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, probably the biggest, biggest change, of course, it has to be the college, uh, the growth in the college. Mm -hmm. it, uh, like I was telling you a little earlier, I can remember there was only two or three hundred students in the college, mm -hmm. and most of them were women. If they were women, if they were all women, and uh, but uh, next thing you know, they started building buildings, and then they dormitories, and and then after World War Two, all the GIs came home, and they had the GI Bill, and boy, then millions of GIs went to school sure. all, over, all over the country, mm -hmm. and. Uh, when the, during the beginning of the war before these GIs went overseas, a lot of them went here and there in, in, in the country to put over the camps or where right. they went to train. And they began to see the rest of the country. So a lot of them, when they came back, uh, weren't happy, were just working in the mill or something like that. They wanted to get out there where the things were really moving. and. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that made all colleges grow. I guess just about all colleges yeah. grow. There may have been some, hmm. but... Uh, hmm. If there was someone in the town, perhaps in your family, that affected you, who would it be? Who would it be? Who influenced you? Did you uh, have a mentor at all? Oh, well, I had uh, two. One would be my brother, Eddie. Mm -hmm. He was in World War II. Yeah. And uh, he came back and he got into various jobs and he became a selectman of the town of Plymouth for quite a few years. And uh, uh, he was a salesman for Deming Chevrolet. Then he became general manager and he ran the Chevrolet franchise there for quite a few years. Where was that located? Was that yeah. located across the river? Yeah. Deming? Well, no, it wasn't. No. No, it no. wasn't. It was on South Main Street, uh, well, across. Uh, down near the subway station is, is now. Bachelor's Tree Service used to be in there. Very but good. But that's where the, he was. Mm -hmm. And uh, across the street was the Ford garage. Pease, Pease, Ford, Pease mm -hmm. Motors. Mm -hmm. That's where the two cars were. Uh, I think sometime later on, uh, Heal came in down South Main Street. Had He sold cars down there. And I think that's the only three we had in town. On the Main Street. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, so, yeah. so Eddie was a major influence. Who else, if any? Carl Adams. Carl Adams. Mm -hmm. Carl Adams was my really my mentor. Mm. He was. He 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 has pushed me along quite a bit. When we first moved into the Plymouth area, I used to do run errands for uh, Mrs. Rand, Mrs. Albert Rand, mm -hmm. and she was the mother of Bob. Ran, but and not Watt. the mother of Watson. Okay. Watson had a different mother, mm -hmm. but uh, and he, she was the mother of Eleanor Dolloff, mm -hmm. and uh, she was a very heavy lady. I don't know how much, I have to try to remember, back, but it seems to me she's over well over two hundred pounds, and she had a little apartment up over the Rand store, and I don't know how I got the job, uh, whether it was Bob or somebody got after me, one no fight like to run some errands for the mother. Hmm. I didn't have anything to do, sure. How old were you, please? Huh? How old were you? Oh, I would have been 10, ten. 9 or 10. Mm -hmm. And so I started working with uh, Mrs. Rand. And uh, 
uh, I run the first national, they had a first national store at that time. Carol Adams was in the first national manager at the time. And she you know, had me go up there, buy the few things she had ate. Mm -hmm. And she loved anchovies. Now, not, not good for her, but she loved them. I didn't eat them, but she had And I'd go up there and they had a meat manager named Sonny Jocks and then and Carol Adams. Sonny Jocks. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they uh, kind of cottoned up to me because I run these errands for this, this lady, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it worked out real good. And then I went down one time, and Mrs. Rand said, uh, uh, I got another job for you if you want to do it. I want you to sweep the hallways in, in, in the Rand block upstairs and down the stairways. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> like it, I had nothing else to do, so I used to do that too. But anyway, uh, uh, and while I was doing that, Kyle Adams uh, quit as first national manager and opened a store for, for uh, his own called Chlorophyll Store, almost next to Anderson's Bakery on the end, right next to the last mm -hmm. one. And uh, uh, the thing that got one good, and he, he said, he got me in one day and said, you want to work for me? I said, oh, I guess so, sure, what? <laughs> well, he said, I can't have you upstairs because you're not old enough. But, he said, you can work downstairs and you can, uh, uh, when the freight comes in, you can put boxes where they have to be p d taken and line them up so when I come down, somebody comes down and wants a can of peas, a can of stuff, they, they'd be right there instead of in the kind of a hodgepodge. Mm. Well, I took to that real good. And mm -hmm. I got that, that's how I, he, he was some tickled why I organized it, because he could write one down and know if he had to order a case of peas or if not. And, and then I would set out the, the cases and stuff to go on the shelves upstairs. But I, I wasn't big enough really to carry those cases upstairs, and they're, they're pretty heavy. But anyway, worked back and forth. They wouldn't have been an escalator uh, to carry them up at that time. Everything was stairways. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. And I, of course, I couldn't handle beer. Absolutely. And uh, that doesn't mean I didn't have pack a few cases around down the basement. <laughs> 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 but anyway, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. his wife came down to help up Madge. Mm -hmm. And uh, we worked down there, had a big bench. We would put eggs, 36, case, 36 dozen eggs in the case. We put them in a dozen boxes and uh, as so. they go upstairs. Mm -hmm. And we'd put dry beans in the ba two pound bags and uh, potatoes. Everything back then was, was a peck of potatoes, not mm. 25 pounds or 50 wow. pounds or whatever they are now. Mm -hmm. It was 15 pounds in a brown bag and you tie a string around it and that's where they sold them. Mm. And we did all that, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and I did it for him. Oh, gee. I think pretty much until I went in the service. I was just going to say, through high school. Yeah, through high yeah. school. And so... Uh, uh, I think you shared with me, did huh? Pat work in Adams's as well, your wife? Oh, did yeah, she worked in the checkout one. Checkout. Uh, when he moved the super stop to where Harris was, had a furniture. Right. That building, yeah. So how many years did you work for Adams's? Uh, I would say... Close to 30. 30 years. As a kid, I had, I probably, as a kid, I probably got four or five years in part-time, you know what I mm -hmm. mean? Sure. And when I came back from the service, I didn't work for him full-time. I. I went to work at Ori Miller's because I had a man named Baxendale who was general manager of Ori Miller's. And he would come up on the train uh, on Tuesday afternoons and go back to Brockton, Mass, where his home was, on Friday afternoons. And he had another, another factory down there he managed for the United Shoe. Mm -hmm. And he'd stay at the Plymouth Inn. And I used to go and uh, play cribbage. Mr. Carpenter, the old man. Buddy Carpenter? Huh? Buddy Carpenter? Uh, Arthur Carpenter? Uh, Buddy's father. 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 Arthur, Arthur Carpenter Sr. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a great cribbage player. Mm. And I'd, I'd seen Pelleen, the salesman, 
I know one man came around, he sold beauty products. And another man came around, I can't tell, he had several salesmen come in on a regular basis on their route. Mm -hmm. And boy, and then they get to the door, he was sitting down playing cards. They wanted to play cards, they wanted to beat him. That's funny. <laughs> but well, I, but and I mean, eventually he taught me how to play. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why, my father did. My father was a good cribbage player, but he mm -hmm. ne we never played cribbage at home. Mm -hmm. But anyway, he taught me how to play, and uh, the, you play cribbage? No. Well, cribbage. Uh, if you have a perfect hand, let's put it now. Perfect, perfect hand, you get a score of 29. There's only two ways of getting it, and the people played. My Ramsey was what I played, and. Uh, my son Peter plays, and uh, his two girls play, and... So I need to learn how to play. Huh? I need to learn how to play. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, uh, Nancy's four kids, wow. all four of them, wow. play cribbage. Wow. And uh, anyway, so mm -hmm. Mr. Cotton and I will play, and... I got a 29 hand, and of course he's all excited. He had a scar, boy, look at that. And he got a whole area of Roberts. Oh. She had a writer right, right for the Plymouth, Plymouth Record. Plymouth record. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the way it was written up is, is Mr. Carpenter uh, dealt me a 29 hand. It's all Mr. Carpenter, Mr. Carpenter. I got the 29 hand, but Mr. Carpenter. <laughs> well, anyway, so, and I've had two in my life. That, mm -hmm. That's really that was, an exception. But as I say, all of our grandchildren, all of them, can play cribbage and play cribbage well. Wow. And they all come in when they're around, come on, Grandpa, we're going to play cribbage. I th say that every kid, every kid should learn to play cribbage because they learn to count. Oh. It's 15 to 15 for all kinds of combinations. Hmm. They learn to count and they learn to count well. Is that how you moved? I wonder if, from your different jobs, because you ended up being in a bank. Yeah, well, coming back to Mr. Baxendale, by the way, if your name is Baxendale, you go to Dartmouth College for nothing. Don't uh, catch too late to change your name. No, he died. <laughs> <laughs> and why, oh, so I, if I was of the same name, is yeah. there a reason for it that you're uh, aware of? family did something way back and left the left mon money? fund the money, yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. But anyway, uh, he was sitting on the porch down at the end one day, and I was down there. I'd been playing cards with Mr. Carpenter. I came out and sat down, and we were talking. He said, "What are you going to do now?" Well, I said, "Well, I'm not sure. I got to get a car because I can't get around without a car." And I said, "I'll see my brother Eddie and get a car." Yeah, and uh, I think I should go to college but I don't have the funds and I'm, my family's going to need some help. And he said, well, how about you come down to, to the factory and you can uh, spend about two, two or three minutes, two or three uh, years here, mm -hmm. I'll put you through all of the jobs and all the whole works and then I want to retire and you'll be general manager. And I said, well, that's the best offer I've had so far. <laughs> And we, I, I chewed the door with Pat and decided that's what we were going, I was going to do. So I went down there and I, I got, uh, I think, about two and a half years through, and I've been, been through most of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, uh, oh, he died. And I said, there goes my job, because the United Shoe didn't have any, any agreement, you know, me just, just him. Mm -hmm. And he apparently had some stock in the United Shoe, a big, big stockholder in the, in the corporation, so he could do something like that. So, next thing I knew, they brought Dick Godfrey. Remember Dick and uh, Dick Godfrey and uh, Betty Godfrey? They lived in Sunset Park, and they had three three kids. And he came in from Orono, Maine, and he, as general manager, and. He worked there for I don't know how long, because when he, when he uh, 
uh, came in that at the end of my job, and I wasn't going to work in Oi Mill off uh, on very long. Mm -hmm. It's already it's, uh, a stop gap if you just don't have a job. And so I quit Oi Mill's. Oh, no, no, no. I was in, working in Oi Mill's, and I got a call from Frank Foster at the bank. He was the, Wh Which bank is this place? Uh, Pemigewasset Pem Bank. Pemigewasset? He was the executive vice president. They didn't ha never had a pre well. They had the president of the bank back then was just chairman of the board, and he presided at board meetings and once in a while a committee or something special. But but he wasn't an, an active officer. You know he wasn't on salary or anything anything like that. He, he, so he called me up there and wanted to know if I come up and see him. I said sure, and I went home and told Pat. I told him, Frank Foster from the bank called me. He wants to see me. Oh, well, what's it all about? Well, I said, I don't know. So I went to see him, and he said they need somebody to start out in the bank, and over a period of time, it could be a pretty good job. And would I be interested? Pardon me, he offered me a job at $54 a week. $54 a week. And your position was? Teller. Teller. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. And uh, $54 a month was what I got in service when I went to the Marine Corps. So this was really good money. <laughs> big big mm -hmm. raise. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, so I went, and because I, then I had Saturdays. I could go to work for Carl Adams, work Saturdays, and uh, nights, and so mm -hmm. forth. Wow. Or whatever. So uh, I took the job. And I went in, and uh, they had the two banks, the Savings Bank, Plymouth Guarantee Savings, and the Pemaji Washit in the same building, right next to the Congo Church. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I had uh, there was a woman named Minnan, and uh, Bill Horrocks, and Phil Tapley at one time. All working part time. I was full time, and Mrs. Miller and I. Okay, so you ended up going from teller to what position? President. President of the bank. President of the bank. And I was the first real full time president that really ran the bank. Hmm. Uh, I was the vice executive vice president was the guy that hmm. he did that. So you took over the bank. Can you remember what year as president? Um, Approximately. Uh, when I took over, well, I worked it from, from head teller. I worked there only six months, and I was mainly head teller. And then I. Uh, All because of cribbage. <laughs> <laughs> I just Pretty much. <laughs> uh, um, I'm going to ask you a question to bring this to a close, I guess, because our time is getting very short. If you had a group of young folks around you, or even if you were conversing with some of your friends, if you were talking about future gen generations, what might you share? What advice might you give? What information you might give them? Because we've been talking today about community. Well, I, education is but you really have to have a college education if you want to go very far, mm -hmm. unless your father owns the business. Okay, okay. You really have to, and mm -hmm. you, uh, coming back to privilege, you really have to count. You have the computer, and the computer do a lot of things, but if you ha can count and play cribbage, then you get the answer. You can tell whether the answer is right or wrong because you understand what it's all about. I'm going to teach myself how to play cribbage. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Our, our time really has come to a close, so Doesn't I want to. Phil play cribbage? I I'll have to ask him. I'll have to ask him. Oh, it's. I think my. I it's think a great my son does. best two-person game I right. know of. I will you, ask we him. played more. We had. I got that a lot, few years mm -hmm. uh, when Pat's father was alive. Uh, we played down in Florida, but when we come back in the summertime, he has umpteen cousins and nephews and so forth in Laconia mm -hmm. and we got so we had uh, a game and there was eight of us playing wow. four, uh, four wow. on each team mm -hmm. that, that was quite a bit of fun and he died and then and somebody else died so that kind of faded away mm -hmm. but uh, uh, 
as far as education, uh, uh, if you want to go to the top, mm -hmm. you're going to have to have an overall information. I can, you can be a real specialist on some things and get to the top, but if, if you're in, in the whole field of things, you really have to have a background of knowledge of all these different things. No, oh, I, I think I want to appreciate and, you, and I want to support you, what you're yeah, saying. You, for, as long as you want to be the top, I mm -hmm. say, unless mm -hmm. Daddy owns the Daddy company. Owns them. Well, I do want to thank you. We want to thank you for sharing your thoughts, your yeah, stories okay. today um, yeah. as part of the Plymouth Historical yeah. Society's initiative. Yeah. Um, I, I think I always try to finish this appealing to the audience. If you have pictures, take pictures. If, if you uh, have I, I, stories... I don't, I don't have really very many pictures. I, we're not a picture family. Well, I think your daughter sent me quite a few. Okay. She did, she did, <laughs> so I'm going to thank Nancy for that one. Oh, right now. oh, oh the kids now. The cameras and everything else. But a lot are not getting printed off, so we say take the pictures, print them off, and if I visited your house and I saw the picture on the wall and we turn it over, there might be a story there. Because yeah. if we don't collect these stories, then we're going to, the next few sure. generations won't know what's happened. And I think talking about Community Day, these were fun stories, so thank you very much. But I think it's important to go back for us to appreciate what we have now. Uh, many of us don't, no, I, I'm going to take that back. Community is important to all of us, but some of us may have forgotten. And it's so important for us to continue yeah. to give to one community, uh, any, any community. So we thank you today for joining us. Until next time. <laughs>